Good evening, guys. Um, Hello. <laughs> I don't have a handout today, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, we're going to be looking at the parable of the unworthy servant in Luke chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles with you, just please turn there. Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. And before we begin, um, if you were here last week, uh, you may recall that Pastor Peter taught uh, in his Bible study on the parable of the sheep and the goats. Uh, this was another parable concerning the end times and told us the judgment that was going to take place when Christ returns. Uh, and I think it kind of goes hand in hand with this parable here as it talks about works. Um, we discussed last week that in the parable, in that parable, like the sheep and goats who live together, believers and unbelievers also coexist in the world today, and they do so even in our churches. Uh, but on the day of judgment, there's going to be a final separation that's going to take place, uh, where some are going to be commended for their good works, um, for their selflessness and kindness to others, and those are going to be the ones who enter into eternal life. Uh, but others who fail to show that same kind of grace and mercy to others um, will be condemned. And they're going to be the ones who are thrown into the eternal punishment um, or hell. So the parable shows us that good works, although they're never the cause for anyone's salvation, uh, are still important nonetheless because good works will be judged by God. Uh, Jesus regards them. And he regards that the good works that we do to do or maybe even not do to others, um, he regards them so much so that the good works that we do to others, he will treat as if we have done directly to him. He says, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. So therefore, if, if we are believers in Christ, we should be able to examine, look at our own lives and see the evidence of and fruit of the faith which is good works uh, even james writes faith by itself if it is if it does not have works is dead so the mark of a true faith is that good works will always accompany it but the question is that i want to i want us to look at tonight is doing good works is doing good works merely enough to reassure us of saving faith Put it another way, does God only care about the presence of good works in our lives? And I think the parable that we're going to look at tonight really addresses this. Because while the absence of any good works can call to question, possibly call to question one's own salvation, uh, or any good works, I mean, uh, can call to question one's own salvation, there's another kind of self-awareness that we have to also be conscious about when we do good works, um, and that is pride. Uh, there can be many sins that keep people from serving and helping others, like laziness and procrastination, but pride is a little more subtle than that, and it's what makes it so deadly. It, it can attach itself to good works and make the person who is doing them seem like they have great and godly faith. But in reality, good works with pride is just rendered useless in God's eyes. There are many charities and organizations in the world today that do a lot of good work. Uh, I'm sure you know a couple of them. Uh, those who, they provide food, clothing, medicine, you know, other kinds of essentials to people in need. Um, and the work that they're doing is actually, it's undeniable. They're, for the most part, a lot of people are benefited by what they are doing. Um, but if the sole purpose of the good works or the charitable works that they're doing is not ultimately God-centered, then it is not God-glorifying. Sadly, even Christians today can be at fault for this when they serve with the wrong motives. Uh, for example, um, maybe it's to attain a certain position in the office of the church. So they'll serve and serve uh, with the hopes of maybe becoming an elder or some other position in the church. Or maybe it's to be seen and, and recognized by the elders or even other uh, members in the congregation for, for what they're doing. 
Um, and it doesn't just have to pertain to physical work, but it can also be spiritual ones as well. Um, there can be spiritual pride that can be found when teaching a Bible study, when the focus is not on the edification of the church, but it's more concerned when the teacher is more concerned about getting praise or, or showing off theology and doctrine and how much he knows. Um, or in evangelism, uh, there can be spiritual pride when, when you're witnessing and you're you're talking to someone and the conversation becomes more about proving the other person wrong than really caring for their soul and wanting for them to come to Christ. So spiritual, spiritual pride can take many forms in, in good works uh, that on the outside may appear godly, but in reality is robbing God of his glory. And so tonight's parable focuses on this issue, and I think it really helps us lay out for us the biblical way for how believers ought to be serving God. So if you have your Bibles with you, again, just please turn to Luke 17. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 10, which is the parable of the unworthy servant. Again, uh, Luke 17, verses 7 through 10. And I'll read it. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So on the face of reading this parable, it can seem to some that we have a thankless God. Uh, but if we were to read the context of the parable, I think it, we can better understand where Jesus is coming from and why he might be saying such things. So although the parable starts in verse 7, it's actually a part of a, a larger discourse that starts from a few verses prior, uh, where we see that Immediately before this, Jesus is warning his disciples about the temptations of sin, uh, to sin. Uh, Jesus tells them about the kind of faith, and, the, and then he proceeds to tell them about the kind of faith that will help them overcome their struggles with sin, or temptations with sin. He says in verse 6, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So, Moving trees with our faith is obviously, Jesus didn't mean this literally, but again, the purpose of his illustration was so that he could make a point about some of the marvelous things that are possible, um, even if it's just with a little bit of faith. The disciples were concerned more about the quantity of and how much faith that they, sh that they needed, but Jesus pointed out to them that it's not the size of faith that really matters, but the sincerity of it. So, and in a similar verse in Matthew 17, Jesus says, If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So, again, Jesus gives them, gives the disciples these truths so that they would know the worth, the value of the faith that they have received uh, and, and entrusted to them. He didn't want them to disregard it as something that it was something that was small. And even though, and also just looking at, you know, who these disciples were, um, they were, they were just a group of ordinary Jews who lived normal lives before Jesus called them. But he, but Jesus specifically chose each of them to follow him. And during his ministry, they were the people that were closest to Jesus. They followed him as part of his inner circle and saw many of the miracles that he did firsthand. And eventually, um, this kind of, Association with him led to uh, arguments, as you might suppose, over who was the greatest and who would be seated next to Christ in his kingdom. Uh, two of his disciples, James and John, even tried to cast down fire from heaven when they lost their patience with a group of unbelievers. But Jesus isn't unaware of you know, what's going on. He's not unaware of their pride, of the pride that's swelling up in his disciples as they are with him. And, he, and he's exposing them to all these truths. He knows that, he knew that if 
he told them about the great works that was possible with faith, that it would cause some of his disciples to puff up. So what he does is he gives them this illustration to help them balance the truths uh, that, he had just, that they had just heard. He wants them to consider the relationship of a master and a servant when they are doing these good works. So like he does in some of his other parables, Jesus begins the parable tonight of the unworthy servant uh, with a question. He, he first asks them, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Jesus here is asking his disciples to put themselves in the position of a master who owned a servant. And the word servant here comes from the word doulos, which is also translated as slave. In essence, he's asking them, how does the master treat his slave when he comes home from fulfilling his duties outside? Um, what happens when the slave comes home after working a long shift, uh, a hard day's work? Does the slave get a chance to rest? Does the master prepare a meal for him uh, and congratulate him or thank him or ask him even to join him uh, beside his table and eat with him? Now, I know we're not familiar, we, some of us may not be familiar with the whole context of uh, the, the cultural context of slavery at that day and age, but even for us today, such questions should seem rather strange. Uh, and to the people then, it was almost unthinkable. Uh, a slave could uh, in no way excuse himself while his master was waiting for his food to be prepared and, and served to him. He didn't have the, the slave didn't have the liberty for any reason to delay uh, following his master's orders. It was, it was pretty much common knowledge and a proper, a rightful expectation that after finishing up uh, your duty in the field, the slave was expected to come home, then prepare the supper or meal for his master uh, and serve it to him, regardless of how tired or how fatigued he was, uh, he may have been at the time. Uh, it, was resp it was his responsibility to make sure that all of his master's needs were taken care of first before he could tend to his own. But what were some of the duties that the slave was required to do? And if we look at verse 7, we'll see that some of the slaves came home from plowing or uh, tending to sheep, keeping sheep. And plowing is a process of breaking up soil, like dividing the soil, uh, so that it can become loose and absorb more moisture and be prepared for planting. Uh, the plow is like an instrument that's used to run through the soil, um, typically held by the worker and then also dragged through the ground by oxen or horses. And, and the worker had to be diligent and had to be, um, you know, he had to really pay attention to what, what he was doing. He had to make sure that the ground itself was being plowed well enough so that when the seeds are later planted, it's, it was going to go deep into the soil. Um, and also another job that the slave could have been doing was uh, tending to sheep. So this work was typically reserved for the youngest member in the family uh, and, and until he grew up and was able to do more physically demanding tasks. So the youngest child was usually the one who was tending the sheep. Um, and then when he got older, he was put to more physically demanding things. But, uh, I mean, even with that said, keeping sheep was not, not easy work. It's, it was a lot of work because it demanded a lot of patience and it demanded also great attention to detail. So at a minimum, it required watching out and protecting the sheep from danger. It required them to feed them and maintaining their health and making sure that all the sheep stayed together and none of them uh, went astray. These demanding, the demanding nature of such jobs of a slave should remind us that our duties as believers are not to be thought of casually or as light matters either. So Jesus gives us some examples in previous verses of the chapter, uh, of the same chapter of what he expects from his followers. He tells them and warns them of the temptations to sin are inevitable to the believer, but 
from the one whom they come from, they are deserving of a great condemnation. He says that it is better for a millstone to be hung around the neck of the one who is causing temptation, and he, were, he was cast into the sea than to lead others to sin. So we certainly ought not to teach or encourage sinful behavior to others, but our conduct and our testimony should also be kept above reproach. Believers should be careful to watch their character lest it becomes a stumbling block to someone else. And also he adds that believers are to share in each other's commitment to pursuing righteousness. He says if your brother sins or rebuke if your brother sins, rebuke him. Even if that's a difficult thing to do. Speak the truth and confront that brother of his sin so that he may repent and be restored. James 5, 19 to 20 says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back, brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And if that person genuinely repents, we are also commanded to forgive him. Now, I know this is, not, this is also not an easy thing to do because if, especially if we were the person, if we were on the side who was wronged, our sinful nature does not want to accept the apology. It, it doesn't want to overlook the sin uh, and, and forgive the brother. But Jesus isn't giving us advice here. He's, he's commanding us. He's instructing us that as many times as forgiveness is requested from us, Forgiveness must be granted. And likewise, no Christian duties are optional. It's, it's not our choice of preference of which ones we want to follow or which ones we don't want to follow, but rather all the responsibilities, all the commandments are required and all of them must be done so diligently. If we look at the next verse in the parable, we see what kind of expectation the master has as he waits for his slave to come home from working in the field. So the slave comes home and the master says to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink. And then afterward you will eat and drink. The, the work of the slave was not done when he came home. His responsibilities uh, shifted from working in the field to his responsibilities of working in the house. Uh, notice also here, Jesus says, uh, the master says, dress properly. Now this, this phrase means to fasten your garment with a belt. It means to gird yourself or tighten your robe so that you'll be ready to work. This, it's a metaphor for us to stay alert and also always be ready to serve. Our work is not done when the day is over or when we go home from church. We ought to keep striving and seeking ways to serve Christ and the brethren all throughout the week, not just on Sundays. And we must be looking for ways to do good to others and laboring with the same love that Jesus showed to his people. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9-12 through 12 says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all believers, to all brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. In John 9, 4, Jesus speaks to his disciples and says, We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Jesus has this sense of urgency because he knew that the time was short and there was still a lot of work to do. Jesus wasn't thinking about rest. He wasn't looking to rest uh, because it, was, it wasn't the time for it yet. He came with a plan. He had a mission to save his people and he was going to accomplish it. In John Calvin's book on Christian living, he says that in order to prompt us toward righteousness more effectively, Scripture tells us that God the Father who has reconciled us to himself in his anointed one, Jesus Christ, has given us in Christ a model to which we should conform our lives. He gives us a model. God not only saves us, but He gives us Christ so that we know how to live this transformed life. 
He gives us a, a new heart with new desires to really glorify Him. And Christ is the ultimate example. So, and Matthew 20, 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. This is the Christ that we ought to imitate, that He's giving us an example of Christ leaving His throne uh, so that He could dwell with sinners, consumed by, of doing the Father's will, that he would, he would eventually lay down his life willingly so that he could accomplish the Father's will. Brethren, let the work of Christ and what he did for us motivate us as well as we look more to him for our desire to serve. Don't look inwardly or expect any kind of thank you or expect him to say any kind of thanks um, either because as a slave uh, was someone who was indebted to his master involuntarily uh, but was eventually set free after paying back what he owed through his years of service, in our case, we also have an, a debt that we owe to God uh, for the debt that he paid for us. But in our situation, in our, in, our, in, our, in our case, we can't pay back God ever for what he did for us like a slave um, who, who owed, I guess, financial debt to his master did. We can't give God more than what he deserves. Um, a slave could pay back through his years of service again and then eventually get his freedom. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. None of our works, the reason why that none of our works could ever pay back God or be a payment to God is because the works that we do are dependent on Him. It's, it's not our works that we are doing for God, um, that we are doing out of our own strength or our own ability, but it is by the grace of God. We are who we are. It's God's working through us um, for His glory. Every work that we do is then only possible because He is the one who enables us and strengthens us to do those good works for Him. All of our works, everything that we do is basically grace-fueled. Uh, no one can boast. Yes, some may be more gifted in, um, in, in teaching. Some may be more gifted in the, in, the, in the fruit of patience and dealing with others and, and caring for others. Some may have the gift of um, even evangelism um, more than others. And, and it's easy to look around and see all these gifts that people have or don't have and, and compare ourselves and, and, and see if, you know, who has what and how much we have, uh, who's doing more, who's doing less. But the purpose of the gifts that God has given to us is not so that we would puff ourselves up, but it's so that we can use them to serve others and then glorify God. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 through 11 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And hence, we look at the final verse of the parable, which says, So you also, when you have done all that you, ha you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Unworthy here means unprofitable or useless. And the idea is not that God does not value his people or sees us as good for nothing. Um, I mean, after all, God sent his only son into the world for, those, for, for us, for those sinners, in order to reconcile us to him. If he saw us as nothing, he would have never sent his son for us in the first place. Jesus here is instead teaching that we ought not to think that we can gain any kind of additional favor from God 
by adding on to what Christ has already done for us. You know, God is the one who calls us first and will later show us the immeasurable riches of his grace all by his own will. I think about the character um, Mephibosheth, uh, I don't know how to say this, but Mephibosheth, um, when Jonathan and Saul both died and David was seeking someone to, in, in the house of Saul to bless uh, with his kindness, there was none but Mephibosheth, uh, who was the lone relative that survived. And David here could have easily continued without ever giving him any notice, any, any attention. David had no obligation to Mephibosheth either. And he could have just continued on with his own life. You know, he was king after all. He didn't owe Saul anything. He was not indebted to Saul. And yet he freely chooses to take this man who was lame in both of his feet um, to where he is in his own palace without demanding any kind of payment or service and sets him on the table with him to eat and not just eat in a, in a different room, but he sets him in the same table, the king's table, it says, to eat with his sons for the rest of his life. And this is what Christ has done for sinners. He, you know, he calls us, he redeems us at no cost. He shows us incredible mercy and forgiveness. And not only that, but he gives us the hope of glory, uh, that we will also be with him in his presence. And he will give us a seat at his table uh, to feast with him. He gives us more than anything that we could ever ask or imagine. And more than anything that we could ever pay him back for. So thinking highly of ourselves or feeling like we deserve some kind of recognition uh, for, for something that we did or think that we are ever worthy of it can never be Christ-exalting. It can never be fully trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's saying that Christ was not enough and that we can somehow add to what Christ has already paid for us. So I want to spend the rest of this time just kind of talking about some of the ways that that we can combat pride, uh, spiritual pride. But um, before I do, um, are there any any questions or I guess anything that from the parable that that you had questions about or anything that you wanted to add? This is going back to what you were saying about um, that our, our good works are only possible because God allows them to be mm-hmm. So if, if some people don't exercise like good works, is it because God hasn't given it to them? Or is it because they themselves are not exercising? Mm. I think... Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are, I mean, you know, all gifts have been given to us um, by God. Um, and I think, like, if we are not exercising gifts that we have, because, like, I think we can know, um, you know, areas where we may be uh, specially gifted. If we are not exercising it, then we, and, and we know that we have that gift, then then I think that we should we should kind of see we should examine ourselves and see if you know what is hindering us from serving or exercising those gifts. Yeah. Uh, just a few thoughts on that. Also, is uh, Ephesians two ten says, you know, we've been saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, gifts of God. Mm-hmm. And then he goes, and he has prepared for us beforehand good works to walk in. And you read the book of Titus, and four times in Titus. <coughs> He mentions good works, be zealous for them, you know, uh, be diligent to, to complete them. And it doesn't just mean gifts, although certainly your gifts will be an area where you'll exercise it. I mean, good works, mm. I mean, it's not just doing, you know what I mean? I mean, it's praying, encouraging, mm-hmm. counseling, giving. I mean, it just the list is long. It's just things that bring God glory, you know? And so, so those things are prepared for us. And 
And Jesus said, I'm sorry, Paul. He said mm-hmm. that, that mm-hmm. God is glorified when we're about those good works. And he wants he, 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 he wants to see much fruit born from us. And that's what the good works are. They bear their fruit. Hmm. Yeah. You, j- j- just to answer to what Pastor B- he just said, um, you know, praying is the key. You know, um, you know how how can I? You know, God has, you know, God has gifted me. I'm, I'm just using it as an example. And, and, well, I'm not sure. You know, where do I fit? You know, in you know, in, you know, in, in in the kingdom. In other words, how can I? You know, so if I'm here not just to sit, but I'm here to serve. Where can I serve? You know, that's why you know, so looking to the Lord and just saying, okay, God. You know, I don't know where where do, where do I go, where do I start? You know, but I want to serve. It, it, it's what you were alluded to be, before. It's it's just one thing to, not just sitting back, and you know, and just not doing anything, but saying, I want to serve. You know, prayer, the reading of the scriptures, being a minister. You know, praying with someone, encouraging someone, and all. I mean, there, there's so many ways. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, um, but but sad to say, you know, there are those that are not, you know, uh, they they just, you know, just burying their talents. In other words, you know, as mm-hmm. parable said, you know, and, and 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 you don't grow, and then you get, you know, all this heart in it. Then you get, and then you say, oh well, this is not the church for me. Mm-hmm. You know, then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think, um, I mean, we don't. Maybe, maybe you think that there's like nothing that you can do, or maybe you don't have any gifts. But I think um, God has God has created like gifts for all of us, um, and it doesn't always necessarily yeah have to be like outward things. It could be like praying for people um, that we can do. Um, but I think, yeah, it comes with, yeah, like the prayer and really seeking, um, you know, what, you know, how I can serve first and just doing it humbly. I mean, I mean good works are the one another's. Mm-hmm. I mean, all those one another's would be good works if they're done with the need to edify and glorify. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because when you said that you start thinking about your gifts, I'm like, I can't play the piano, I can't sing. What am I good for? I didn't get any gifts. And then you realize, yeah. You know, I I pray for them. I could uh, ask them if they need any help. I could do things. I mean, I have no talents. I have no gifts, right? And it's like what you said, for Like he gives you that. He he's the one that administers those things that you should be doing, and we need to act on them. Because if you know that my sister is struggling with something that she can't bear, and you don't even give her counsel on it, like a bad marriage or say something went on in the household and you can't counsel her <coughs> in the word, then you're not using what God has given you that mm-hmm. you know, the ability to comfort and, and give, you know, advice to them things, biblical advice. Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah. it was like there was like Dorcas in in uh, Acts ten or eleven, I forget, where she dies, the ladies go, the widows go to Peter and say, you know, yeah, she was a great woman. And she made tunics for the widows. I mean, you know, she made tunics for the widows. And you know what? She, she, it was a good work. Yeah. And, and she was, she, she honored God and she blessed, she blessed the widows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, as a Christian, you know, God gives you that desire that you want to do different things. And people who are gifted in a lot of different things, then they use their talents for the glory of God. But even the ones who really don't know how to do anything substantial, what they think is substantial, even if you give them a certain amount of advice, you know, what things are encouragement, or, uh, you know, you know, just give them a ride, you know, do them a favor, you know, do something for them in some small way that it seems like it's nothing, but to them it's like, gee, and nobody else has really done it for me, mm-hmm. you know, or nobody too much, and it's and it's really something special to them. 
and it helps them with their walk, with their encouragement, mm. because a lot of times when people get into serious problems, they become destroyed. And sometimes they need encouragement. Mm. You know, somebody to talk to, uh, somebody to, you know, uh, help them to feel better. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's, and, and like I said, there's so many other different little things that seem so insignificant, but in reality, they're not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just one more question. So, um, because of that verse that you uh, mentioned about God already prepared kind of everything for us and um, deployed and things like that, um, so would it make sense to not, like, would it not make sense to pray for gifts? Like, I know some people pray, like, oh God, give me the gift of whatever. Um, would that not make sense because the gift clearly tells us that He's already given what He would have given to us? Um, no, I think I think we can still pray for it. Um, like we can pray, but God might not necessarily give it to us. Um, and sometimes, maybe like He could use our prayers as the means to give us gifts, if if um, if that's His like will to do so. But Catherine, I, I wouldn't get hung up on, on the gift. You know what I mean? Because if I don't have the gift of something, I'm not going to do it. You know what I mean? And so serving is from the heart. You know, you do what you can. Jesus said about Mary, she did what she could. You know what I mean? So when you do what you could to bless others, that's a good work. When you pray for people, that's a good work. You know, when you encourage people, that's a good work. If you do it for the glory of God and to, and to bless others. You know, when you serve behind the scenes and no one sees it, but you do it for the glory of God, that's a good work. You know, when you when you love and encourage your husband, that's a good work. When you raise up your son and appear in that mission of the Lord, that's a good work. You know what I mean? So don't don't get caught up in the whole thing of gift because that narrows it to this law well, I have to be an evangelist in order to talk to people. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't get caught up in, in the specifics. It's just the heart and the life, I think. Yeah. Sorry. No, yeah, and I think that's Oh yeah. And, and it says, and I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know where it is, but when it talks about the body, how the, the head can't go without the foot, and it says that the unseemly parts are the most important. Mm -hmm. So those who are doing things. First Corinthians 12. So those who might be doing things behind the scenes, but it's important to God because maybe they're not getting any recognition or anything mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. I think it's, it is about, I mean, I think what the parable is also saying is, yeah, again, it's not like the fact that we, like, God cares about what we do. He definitely does. But also about, like, the heart and the attitude and how we do those good works. Um, so, you know, you could be, you could be, and I think it's like another parable, another story, um, about like the the rich man and then also um rich man who gave a lot of money um it's it's in mark 12 um you know he he put large sums of money into the treasury but then a poor widow came and she only gave two small coppers uh, of coin um into the treasury and you know when we look at it it looks like yeah you, you know the people who are putting a lot of money into the treasury are like very godly or doing a lot and you know you don't really think about the, the person who only gives like two pennies but um, Jesus says you know she gave out of her abundance um, yeah yeah not for, that person you were talking about he he didn't give everything that he had he gave his excess yeah but he still Sorry, had yeah. his core wealth still with with the old woman she gave everything she had yeah. I mean, those two mites or whatever they were back then, I mean, that would have bought something for her, you know, in uh, her own small world, but she get, she gave it all. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, and that's what, uh, you know, that we should do, which I know, uh, you know, we're, we're all guilty at one point or another of not giving everything that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they gave out of, yeah, their abundance and she gave out of, yeah, almost nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. So, um, yeah, again, 
want to, I guess, wrap up the, the lesson here by talking about some of the ways and, you know, feel free to contribute about how we can c- combat pride. And one of the things that were mentioned, Jose, you said um, the importance of prayer. Um, you know, there are many prayers in the Bible. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, David's when he prays, um, you know, to God in Second Samuel verse se- chapter 7. Um, he says, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come, and this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. David had many accolades, and he won many wars and overcame many trials, and he did all of this and and, and had great success, but he never let any of this get over his head. Um, Instead, he saw his own merits and achievements and accomplishments um, very lowly. He had a very low view of them, because he knew that those victories were given to him by God. It, it was God's good favor to him. And, you know, he is able to return that glory to God um, because he knows he has a right view of where his success came from. Yeah. Also, the thing is, you got to, you know, learn how to swallow your pride, repent of your pride. That, uh, I forget what I was going to say. I just, I had a whole sentence I can't remember right now. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's it's yeah. hard to be prideful when you're praying. Like when you're praying, um, like you're really depending on God. I mean, there are, I guess there are ways to pray pridefully too. But if you are genuinely, what was that? The Pharisees. Yeah, like the Pharisees. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't real prayer. Right. It was a resume. Yeah. But yeah, prayer is definitely um, a powerful tool to fight pride. Um, another thing is, what was that? Oh, another thing is that we should remember is um, to consider where we we came from. I, I also love this verse in in First Corinthians one twenty six to thirty one. Uh, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to think nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Um, remember, you know, where we were called from, that God chose us. Um, he didn't choose the wise and the strong, but He chose what is foolish and low and despised in the world um, to achieve and accomplish, you know, His purposes. You know, I'm sorry. No, yeah. I'm just thinking here, you know, how, how the Scripture, you know, describes us as slaves. You know, and, 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 and we know that that word in, 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 in the culture today, in light of the social justice, you know, mm. movement and all that, you know, it does not, does not sit too well with many people, even within the church, too. Mm. You know, the, you know, the connotation, you know, um, but slave, you know, Paul is slave of Christ. You know, we see, we see that, that example. So, <clears throat> excuse me. But to be a slave of, you know, Christ is the master. He rules. He reigns. Mm. We do. We, we we do as he commands. In every aspect, in every, every wherever we go, whatever we do, it is all about him. Not it's nothing about us. Right. You know. Um. It it is it is. You know, and 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 the thing is that, like you said, you know, out of Ephesians chapter two where we came from and now where we are so so we're no we're no longer of this world though we live in this world but we're no longer of this world we, you know because our eyes are focusing on the heavenly hmm. you know I, 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 we, we are just waiting we are just groaning as the scripture says 
they you know for for his return mm. so what what you know what are we going to do now as the church in, at large you know or, you know how how are we going to redeem the time mm. you know or, or are we going to you know just sit back and just allow you know the lures of this world to penetrate our thoughts and think this way or that way because Sad to say, you know, the, 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 the church, you know, has, has, I mean, has gone backwards, has, has compromised in, in so many fronts, mm. you know, for the sake of being inclusive, mm. you know, and, 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 and we don't stand up, we're not bold, yeah. you know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you know, but, and, and, and it's sad because, you know, uh, pa pa Pastor Pete, you know, said it from the pulpit, you know, you, you, you got, we got wolves out there. You know, preaching from those same pulpits, you know, and many people are listening to this garbage, hmm. you know, and not responding to what thus saith the Lord, you know, and, and, and it moves me, you know, it, 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 to the point that it angers me also because I'm saying we we are supposed to be people of the word, and sometimes we walk like we're defeated, you know, and, and, and I don't know. Forgive my. You know, but it's just hmm. what? How are we gonna, you know, spend this time as we wait for the Lord's return? Hmm. Yeah. You know, so. Hmm. I have a question. Um, I think I wanted to ask this question to my dear brother. When and I never dared, so I'm here going. When you say he um, in the scripture, he says that he was um, pleased to. Use the despised, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, um, first Corinthians, yeah, one. Why, why would we be considered the despised, or even at that time, they were considered the, the despised? You understand what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> how, why would we be despised because we're walking in the Lord and they see Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit in us, and then we despise, or we were despised because we were nobody? from the beginning and then he used you. He didn't use like I guess a prominent man, like the president or something. I, I'm not sure exactly mm. what that means. Mm. Can that make any sense? No, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, um I yeah that I think he's yeah I mean um I think it's just she's just trying to make a point um, here, just saying not to be, you know, like he's he's telling them to consider where they came from. Um, yeah, they're just like reminding them, yeah, What's where the they came from. Not many wise, not many normal ones. Right? Don't say not any. Says not many. Well, it also says in twenty eight in the ESV, it says God chose ones low and despised in the world. Right. So it's the world's opinion of what God chose is that they're low and despised. Not God's opinion. Yeah, so the so despised really we just move a bunch of nobodies. But the world doesn't value us according to the world's standards. So according to the world's standards, you know, we're just a bunch of you know, regular Joes. Right. Yeah. But like it was in First Corinthians, I think it's chapter two. The people who are perishing the cross is foolishness, complete foolishness. But to we who believe, it's the words of eternal life. So when uh, we're speaking the truth, you know, we're talking from God's wisdom. But the rest of the world, the people around you, it's all foolishness. Uh, it's a joke. I remember talking to a Jewish fellow. And he says, Jesus is nothing but a troublemaker. You know, I say, no, how's that, you know? And then, you know, it's just one uh, tail spin into nothing. He ends up walking away. Mm. Yeah. I, I kind of thought this fight could have been, I understand it, um, but I also thought for a minute that it could be, Somebody that, that was doing so bad in their walk, like in their life, that they, they were worthy, but now I'm taking you out, you know, and I'm going to use you. Hmm. Like, they despise us because we were terrible. You say from the world's perspective, mm -hmm. most of the people that are saved 
are are are, are nothing to brag about. They're just average people. They're not they're not noble and mighty and wise. You know what I mean? They're not they're not the um, you know the professors and the scientists and you know the famous people. Although there are some. Yes, some. Some. Yes. But not many. For the most part, most of us were just fishermen and tax collectors and, and, you know, and all these little jobs. You're not. I know. Just <laughs> yeah. yeah, amen. Um, I just want to, I guess, wrap up the Bible study here um, by one of, I guess, like one of my favorite quotes. Um, it's by John Piper, and he says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Um, you know, when we when we think about our service and our acts to God, um, you know, we shouldn't think of it um, as merely just we have to do this and this is something that God is commanding us to do. But um, there is a genuine joy that we can have when we are doing good works. It's it's no longer burdensome to us. His commandments are not burdensome for those of us who are truly uh, saved. Um, there is a joy that we can have. I love reading Psalm 119, uh, where it talks about, there's some verses, and I just want to end it by sharing some of these verses here from, from that chapter about loving God's word and, and keeping his commandments. He says, uh, 15 and six, Psalm 119, 15 and 16, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. 46 and 47, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame, for I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. And then 69 and 70, the insolent smear me with lies, but my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. Um, I think, yeah, the, again, the most important thing is that, you know, it's not just about the the outward or you know what we're doing, um, but we ought to really just consider you know our hearts and motives for when we are serving God, because I think that's what um, you know God really looks at. Um, again, it's not just not just doing a lot, but um, our hearts um, when we are serving Him. And I can definitely grow in that. Um, I know, uh, and and I, I pray that like you know our church. Um, you know, would also be able to serve and, and love one another, um, not just merely just doing it on the outside, but again, doing it for the honor and glory of God. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll close us out in a word of prayer. Um, uh, our Father, Lord, we thank you. Um, Lord, I thank you for this privilege of being able to share and teach your word. Uh, Lord, I know it is, um, is not something to be taken lightly. And, and forgive me, Lord, if there was any uh, pride in my own heart, Lord, as I was preparing and uh, Lord sharing, Lord, tonight. Um, I pray that you would, um, you would increase, you would help us to decrease. Lord, help us to uh, truly serve you, uh, Lord, for, for you alone, not to be seen or not to be appraised by others but lord you know everything that we do in secret and uh, lord i pray that that would be um, our only motivation lord it would not be for anything else lord help us to grow in these graces lord help us to um, continue to see christ continue to meditate on your word and, and love your commandments and i pray for for all of us here tonight um, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.